because I will hear what God the Lord said. And then mercy and truth are met together. No, no uh, uh, mercy and truth have kissed. Peace and righteousness spring from the ground. Well, peace doesn't grow on the ground. What's it talking about? It's talking about a natural outflow. When you and I get thoroughly right with God, we can't help but tell other people. Amen. They can't help but see there's something different about them. Mm -hmm. We want to go reach them. But if our heart has not been kindled with the fire from above, if our heart is not filled with the love of Jesus, we can't reach a butterfly, mm -hmm. let alone a lost and dying world around us. Look, the scripture gives us not only there, but in Psalm 1, it gives us the picture of the continually revived man. It's too high up here. Y'all too far away. Okay. We, we don't have to have a service once or twice a year to, to have true revival. That's right. mm -hmm. You can maintain revival in your life every day, young brother Rutledge. Amen. Blessed is the man mm -hmm. that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. The first step to con being continually revived is to not listen to the counsel of the world. Yeah. But we do. Mm -hmm. Stand in the way of sinners. I know, Billy, you can't believe this, but I have stood right back there and heard somebody talk about how they mix their margaritas. God help, that ain't helping nobody. Mm -hmm. we, we're not just listening to the counsel of the ungodly. We're standing in the way of sinners. We don't, we're, we don't act any differently than they do. Mm -hmm. We talk like they do. We got all these things stuck in our bodies like they do. Come on. We listen to the same trashy music they do. Preach. And are sick. In the seat of the scornful. And this is something, brother, it's really hard for us to get a hold to. But you can have cynics in God's house. Yep. There's people, there's probably people sitting right here, right now, who don't believe God can turn this country around. Mm. And you know what? What you believe is what's going to happen. That's right. That's right. That ain't Bible. Yes, it is. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You don't think revival can come? You will not experience revival if you don't believe God will do it. Amen. We've got to get back. If God's people called by God's name shall humble, pray, seek, and turn. Now, <clears throat> I told them this morning, I'm telling you again tonight, that the first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles are, are very similar. Yes. Except first and second Kings talks about the division. Under Rehoboam. Mm -hmm. And then from that point forward, it talks about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, which would be Benjamin and Judah. Now, maybe you remember this, maybe you don't, but the northern kingdom never had a good king. Mm -hmm. Their kings always did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. <clears throat> the southern kingdom had some good kings, and the way they, they, they used the term good king, but Old Testament speak. For he was doing what God wanted him to do was he walked in the ways of David. That's right. Good. Now for some people this was David's grandchild. Some of them it's like seven generations down from David. Second, first and second chronicles were written, I believe, by Ezra, but we know whoever wrote it, it was written by the inspiration of God, and it was written after they come back from captivity. Remember David, God sent them preacher after preacher after preacher. If you don't do what I said back in the law, I'm going to send you into captivity. Mm -hmm. And they killed him. Right. Remember when Jesus was preaching in the New Testament? He said, oh, Jerusalem, what did he call it? Thou that killest the prophet. They didn't listen. I submit to you today that, that you can come to church three times a week. We can go back to the days of Acts and meet seven times a week. And if you don't listen to what God says, you're going into captivity. Now, I think the winds of revival 
are always blowing. And the reason I, I call it winds is because sometimes the, when the Spirit of God moves, it, it actually translates into our Bibles as the word wind. Okay, so I'm not twisting scriptures to call it the winds of the Bible. One of my favorite verses is 2 Chronicles 16, 9. But I very seldom quote the second half of the verse, Brother Larry, because the second half of the verse is proving that God's people refuse to do what God wanted them to do. You see, the first half of the verse said, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. It, it, to put that in words that we can grasp in 2024, the eyes of the Lord are continually running forever throughout the entire earth to prove himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect. Now, that doesn't mean faultless. That means completely stayed on him. Okay? To prove himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The second half of the verse said, Herein thou hast done foolishly. You see, that was, there, there are five revivals that are recorded for us. One is under Jeroboam. One is under, uh, I'm sorry, it's under Rehoboam. One is under Jehoshaphat. One is under Asa. One is under Hezekiah. And one is under Josiah. Now, those may not be in order, but those are the five revivals that are recorded in the book of 2 Chronicles. Asa is one of those people. That statement that God's eyes are running to and fro to prove himself, prove himself strong on our behalf were, were said to Asa. When Asa was a young man, he saw a revival. That's right. He was a revival leader. God used him mightily amongst the people of the southern kingdom. But in his old days, brother, he tried to do it himself. He tried to make alliances as opposed to trusting God. Yeah. And God said, oh, you, you want to trust other people instead of trusting me? Great, you go have wars. Mm -hmm. That's all you're going to have is wars and trouble. I say again, we are scripturally, biblically, you might say, but scripturally illiterate and spiritually impotent. Don't, don't raise your hand. But I know a portion, maybe even every one of you, spend some time each week, maybe each day, some people each hour, on social media. <clears throat> on social media, I see this all the time and it bugs me. And I'll be honest with you, if somebody I know posted, I message them and correct them. Because it's biblically illiterate. It says God can use everybody. Moses was a murderer. Noah was a drunkard. David was an adulterer. Then they list two or three other people that God used. But the problem with that is Moses was a murderer before he got by. That's right. That's right. David and Noah actually failed miserably late in life. That's right. I don't want to be that guy. They don't. I don't want my kids to say, Daddy served God unto you. Yeah. yeah. Huh? There's too many Christians out here who serve God until somebody hurt their feelings. Until something didn't go their way. Until they didn't have control over this or control over that. So Good, the, brother. The, the reasons are infinite. But I want to finish right. Amen. But that statement to Asa proves that the God's winds of revival are always blowing. There are four things that are mentioned there in 2 Chronicles where we started. That's the wind of humility. You see, God resists the proud to give grace to the humble. Right. And, and Martin, if I can be so forward as to use your first name, too many of us in church are secretly arrogant that we are, we're proud of the fact that we're not out there doing drugs and drinking and cheating on our wives and all that stuff. There's no justified pride in Scripture. God is not going to use me if I'm so excited about how spirits I am. God uses the humility. Huh? You know, Paul described himself as the chief of sinners even after God had used him to start countless churches. God 
Sometimes winds of revival are blowing, but the very first step to you being revived as an individual or to Lighthouse being revived as a church is to hoist the sail of humility. Right. The, the second thing we have to hoist is the, the prayer sail. Mm -hmm. It's been 15 years ago, Chris, I read a statistic that the average pastor spent less than five minutes a day in prayer. Yeah. If that's true for the pastor, what is it like for the people? That's right. That's probably good. You see, instead of praying and talking to the person who can change something, we want to seek a counselor. <laughs> we want to listen. We want to. We want to stand. Uh, 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 just walk in. Walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We want to stand in the way of sinners. We don't want to delight in the law of the Lord. We want to figure out what the world says we need to do to fix it. But what we need to do is address the only person who can fix it. Amen. Amen. And that's the Lord God Almighty. We have to hoist that humility sail, but we have to hoist that sail of prayer and talk to the Creator. Amen. Talk to the Savior. Talk to the all. I, I mean, hey, look, if you got to guess who I'm voting for, you don't know me very well. All right? <laughs> I am not voting for a uh, an anti-biology, anti-Bible, anti-science, anti-Christ, anti-everything, anti-American, bless God. I may not like the rude guy, but I'm going to vote for the rude guy that loves the Bible and loves Christ. He may not even be a Christian, but he loves us. Amen. All right. Now, if you've got to guess who I'm voting for, you just don't know me very well. Amen. But he is not the Savior. Right. He is not going to bring this country out of the out of the locust and pestilence of all this stuff we talked about. And I, you know I just barely scratched the surface of the things our country faces. It's me and you, David. We've got to hoist the flag of humility, hoist the flag of prayer. And you know, uh, the, not the flag, but the sail. Uh, you know most Americans, including church members, are seeking a better job, a better spouse, a better house. We got a voice to seek in the Savior. That's right. You know, Paul said when he's been saved about 25 or 30 years, he's in a jail cell mm -hmm. waiting to have his head chopped off. And he said, I want to know Christ. Knowing he's been saved 30 years, David. But he wants to know him better. Amen. But too often, we're saved, sit down, satisfied, and sour. Right. Amen. We know all the reasons why we're better than the people out there. We want God to change, but he's not going to change them until he changes us. Yes, right. It's right. good. Amen. We got to seek the same. That, that fourth sale, I call it the turn sale. Turn from their wicked ways. Huh? Did you know statistically it's less than a 1% difference in those of us who are in a church and profess to be Christian in drunkenness and those people outside the church who don't profess to be Christian? Mm -hmm. Did you know that statistics say that 9 of 10 men even in this room are addicted to pornography mm -hmm. and view it at least weekly? Now, this really blows my mind. But the statistics say more than three in ten women are. No difference between the church and the world in these statistics. Do you know there's no difference in the church and the world on the statistic of divorce? Did you know there's only a 1% difference in people who profess to know Jesus Christ in the ungodly, egregious, the Bible calls it abominable sin of sodomy and the world? Amen. I tell you, we have got to hoist the humility, hoist the prayer, hoist the seeking the Savior, and hoist the repentance. Amen. What is repentance? That, my friend, is repentance. You turn from it to the living God. But you know, there's five revivals. Every one of those revivals has all four characteristics. But each one emphasizes one. So there's only four. Humility is in Rehoboam's revival. And in 
and Josiah for God. I know folks in an independent Baptist church ain't going to admit it, but somebody out here has seen the movie Maverick. That's like Top Gun 2. And in that movie, Tom Cruise's character, Maverick, is on a sailboat. And they have four sails up on the trees. And the young lady who's steering the boat says, pull such and such a string and run that jib up. He said, I fly planes. What is a jib? She said, that's the afterburner. That's it. And when that big old blue jib sail goes up, well, that old sailboat takes off. It was moving pretty good. And if you and I will hoist the sail of humility, prayer, seeking a savior, and turn, mm -hmm. the church will be moving pretty good. Mm -hmm. You see, the problem is the church. They, they quoted the old country preacher when I was a boy. He said, the church and the world is like a boat in the river. And when you got the boat in the river, things are as they should be. But when you get the river in the boat, mm -hmm. you got problems. Yeah. And I'm telling you, too often, even in the most conservative churches, baby, right. we've got the world in the church. Mm -hmm. So we not only need those four sails, but we need that extra humility. You know, when we are most likely to be arrogant, we don't want to admit this. Mm -hmm. But the closer you get to Christ, the more likely you are to be arrogant and see yourselves as better as other people who are struggling where you were Sometimes six days ago, but maybe six years ago, and for some of you, you might have been 60 years ago. I can't guess how old you are, but there's never a place in God's plan for us to be arrogant. They see, I still think, David, that God can turn this country around, but even right now while I'm preaching, there's people sitting out here going, it ain't never going to work. It ain't going to happen. It's too far gone. Yeah. We use our, I'm going to move one of your chairs. We use our, our doctrine. They're calling us to do this. Mm -hmm. You see, we sit on our hands. They say, 2 Timothy 3 says, it's going to wax worse and worse. <laughs> you realize they've been saying that for 2,000 years. You realize, I know it, it's Sunday night and I should shut up and let you go home. And if y'all don't know this, it's nearly one o'clock in the morning for me. Amen. <laughs> okay. You know, all 13 colonies were started by Christians. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Plymouth and Connecticut were actually church plants. Right. What is now Massachusetts, the Scrooby Group, which was a local church moved and started that college. Connecticut, a church from Massachusetts, moved and started Connecticut. It was started by a local church. And yet, Bill, within a generation, any of those colonies needed revival. Yeah. 1620 Plymouth was started, but they had a revival because they had a need for it by 1650. We say our country started July the 4th, 1776, which has always blown my mind because my Marine Corps started November 10th, 1775. The Army was started on June 16th, 1775. Uh, Y'all the, the young ones, you just got there. Amen. 1948, I think. Seven. 47? Okay. So the, the Navy started in October of 1775. Hey, this is really blowing your mind. If y'all can remember, I said we're, we're historically and biblically illiterate. Do you realize the shot heard around the world was, was fired in April of 75? And we didn't sign the Declaration of Independence until July of 76? Here's the news for you. Our country was born more out of a revival that we call the Great Awakening. There is no clock here either. <laughs> uh, more out of the Great Awakening than it was. The, the revolution was the fruit of the Great Awakening. But by the time the Constitution was ratified, we needed another one. The Second Great Awakening started with Jonathan Edwards' grandson, Timothy Dwight. He was the president of, of Yale, whose, whose 
motto is Lux and Veritas for all of us non-Latin speakers. That's light and truth. Mm -hmm. It was a preacher's comment. And yet he realized that the, the vast majority of the student body at a preacher's college did not believe that, that God's word was God's word and on that it was reverence. But rather than doing what we have done for most of my life, which is uh, a, a retreat inside the, the walls of God's house and complain about them, he, 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 he debated them. He preached series of sermons on it. Now he wasn't the only one. But you know, every time that there's a revival, God raises up at least one person who gets thoroughly right with God, and then they help other people, help other people, help other people turn, turn a, a church, and then a community, and then a country to Christ. Amen. Amen. When the church gets thoroughly right, there's missions. Mm -hmm. Great Awakening produced David Brainerd, who tried to reach the Indians. The Second Great Awakening produced the father of American foreign missions, Adnan Judson and Luther Rice. Now, most people don't know Luther Rice's name, but you see, those two men left the colonies, or excuse me, the, the, earth, the young America, headed to, to India, and they were going to convince uh, William Carey why he was wrong on, on credo baptism, believer's baptism, because they were a pedo Baptist, they baptized babies. But when they got there, Brother Laird, after studying the scripture, they had him baptize them. Amen. And Luther Rice went back to raise money so that so that Adnan Judson could reach the people there. Uh, the country's changed names 14 times, but Burma at one time it was called. The, 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 that second great awakening. Got us through the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. By the 1850s, churches were dead. Mm -hmm. A retired salesman named Jeremiah Lambert was hired by a Baptist, well, Baptistic church. They didn't have Baptist in the name, but I've read what they believed, and they were pretty much a, a little more Calvinistic than we are. But he wasn't seeing any fruit knocking doors, Tom. It's because God's church wasn't right. So he started a prayer meeting. The first day they had that prayer meeting, two other people showed up when the hour was almost over. But within something like six weeks, 10,000 business. Now this, this wasn't in Atlanta. This wasn't in Columbus. This is in New York City. 10,000 businesses were closed at lunch for prayer. You see, we think it's taken us decades to get this, this debauch this far from God. God can't send a revival. But I can read you. I won't take the time because I'm already going too long. But I can read you a revival where 150 years of debauchery, the Bible says God revived them suddenly. Amen. Suddenly. Mm -hmm. We just got the hoist of humility, hoist of prayer, hoist of seeking a Savior, hoist of the turn sail. That's right. Oh, but I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't run around with people that do. You know, there are sins of omission just like there are sins of omission. Yeah. Huh? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hoist the turn sail and then hoist that humility sail again. I remember, I can tell you his name, I can give you an out sermon outline too. You probably recognize the sermon outline. I remember a man in the 90s when I had just early surrendered to preach. Who said, What? Well, I don't like him with things that get me. You know, I call him, I don't know what he wants. He thought he's become that guy. I know for a fact he drove a few states away to see some people in a man's church. We're going to say his name is Chris Rutledge, but he wasn't, I promise. He hadn't been in that state. But he said, Brother Chris, I know you're a little discouraged. Won't you come hang out with Brother So-and-so? Brother, Brother Famous Evangelist is coming to town. Won't you come hang out with him? When he showed up, David, the Famous Evangelist said, I come here to hunt, not fellowship, leave me be. And he wouldn't even talk to the man. Mm -hmm. You see, the greater God uses us, the more we're in need of that humility. Mm -hmm. Help the Lord.
Avery Revival. You, you, you realize that that, that that revival that started with Jeremiah Lampier took us through the Civil War. In the 1870s, God started another revival that took us through World War I. And then by the 1920s, we in need of a revival again. Yeah. People that God used greatly in, in, the, in the late 1800s and through World War I died in the 20s, mm -hmm. seeing the need for revival. World War II and Depression kind of brought its own revival. So much so that Patton, now you like him or not like him, he was crazy, but I like him. Amen. Patton sent a fellow to look for a chaplain and said, we need to pray. If God don't clear this weather, all those men over there are going to die in, in that forest. We call it the Battle of the Fall. The young lieutenant went down and found a preacher. And he said, General Patton requires your presence in headquarters. He said, I'm not going up there where y'all been drinking whiskey, smoking them cigars. He wants to see me. He can come to the chapel like everybody else. I'll have you court martial. General Patton requires your presence. I done told you once, I ain't going up there. I'm going to have you court martial. Be that as it may, I'll be right here if he wants to pray. The young lieutenant goes back all angry fired. I, he wouldn't even come. He said, boy, that's the preacher we look at. That's right. <laughs> and Patton himself, crazy as the best he bug he might have been, but he knelt down in that right. chapel and he said, God, I can't help but feel like I have offended you. If you'll show me what I've done so that I can ask your forgiveness and you'll clear, I'll do it. And if you'll clear this weather, I'll give you Germany for your son's resurrection. God cleared the weather and he won. But you and I, don't, we don't. We sit in church three times a week, and we don't believe God can work. Every time there's a revival, God raises up one somebody who then empowers other people. When when I was 16, David, I was rebellious as I could be. When Josiah was 16, God was using him to revive a nation. And God used Josiah to revive the preachers. You understand? In our world, Josiah was a politician, but God used the politician to get the preachers to clean God's house out. Now, you say God can't send a revival. And I say if you believe that, you're right. The fact is, neither of us know if God will send a revival. And if you're honest biblically, you know he could. But we don't know if he would. You see, Martin, when, when they read what God promised he was going to do because of their rebellion, he said, we're in trouble. That's right. He didn't say our fathers have sinned. He said we have sinned. You go read Nehemiah's prayer. Nehemiah was a godly man, but he confessed the sins of his countrymen as if they were his. But you and I confess the sins of our country in condemnation of them, not in an attempt to see God work in our lives and theirs. Hmm? And when, when Josiah read that, or it was, it was read to him, he said, you go inquire of the Lord and see if he will stay his hand of judgment. They came back and they said, the Lord said, I'm going to judge Israel like I said I'm going to judge Israel. But because of your response, I'm going to wait here with me. I'm going to wait you go home. Hey, I don't know if he's going to turn our country around. But I want to be the one dying trying. Right. I Amen. want to be faithful unto death. Amen. I want to be sitting there waiting to have my head chopped off for preaching going, Hey, the saints that be in the jail with me greet you. Because I'm still winning people to Christ even when I'm waiting to have my head chopped off. What you going to do? Will you determine to be the one in your circle? You see, God wants to use you, ma'am. God wants to use you, sir. God wants to use you, sir. The question is, are you going to let him? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of preaching tonight. I pray that you would help us to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. Lord, as the preacher comes, I pray you've had your will in this service. I pray you would help us determine, each of us, to be the one you revive and use in our circle of influence, Lord. Lord, you don't require success. You require faithfulness. Lord, 
help us to be faithful even unto death. For it's in Christ's name we ask it.